So what I'm going to talk about today is how I came to start printing and um, how I um, and the journey it took me on and the relationship between printing, painting and a certain type of poetry. So I first met Kip uh, down in Cornwall in St Ives. We had both been to an exhibition of a mutual friend, Terry Frost. I hadn't met Kip before, and um, in the pub afterwards, um, I was introduced to Kip, and uh, in, during the conversation, he said to me, why don't you come to Cambridge and make some prints? And I was intrigued by the idea. <clears throat> but when I got back to London, and I was back in the studio, I just got totally back involved with my paintings. And while I'm not forgetting Kip's suggestion, it was rather at the back of my mind. However, five years later, um, I was in Rome, a city where I'd lived and where I visit frequently. I was invited by a family who collect my paintings. I was invited to dinner. At that dinner was a, f a fellow guest who introduced himself to me as Sergio Insuzio Becker. And he told me that he'd been looking at my paintings in the family's collection, and he... Th oh, sorry, I, didn't, I pressed something which I didn't mean to. Um, and he told me that uh, he, he thought that my paintings were very appropriate to a project he was working on. Uh, so Sergio said, I am the son of the lawyer the Chilean poet and uh, the Nobel laureate, Pablo Neruda. And the project I'm working on is to uh, celeb celebrate Neruda's life on the 25th anniversary of his death. And there's going to be events all over Latin America. Would you be interested in making an exhibition in your response to Neruda and his poetry? And I was absolutely thrilled with the uh, suggestion. But I was also slightly nervous because um, I'd never worked from a literary source before. I was familiar with Neruda's poetry, but I'd never worked from a literary source. <coughs> but weeks later, I was back at... Oh, bloody hell. I don't know what I'm pressing you. That's it, OK. Yeah. So... Um, Weeks later, I was back in London, and um, I got a phone call from Sergio saying, look, I'm flying to London, I want to meet you, uh, and bring, uh, meet you in your studio, and I'm going to bring a friend who's going to be uh, very helpful in the organising of your exhibition. So they turned up at my studio, and uh, his friend was a man called Jose Antonio Vieira Gallo. And Jose Antonio was a senator in the Chilean, the social democratic Chilean government, the one that overthrew Pinochet. And uh, so, uh, Jose said to me, um, look, uh, we're going to take, the Chilean government's going to take care of all, your ex all the expenses, your, your travel, your uh, hotels, and transportation of the work, etc. But he also said to me, I know you're making 25 paintings for this exhibition, but could you also make something which could, we could keep in our collection on a permanent basis and which was possibly done in multiples so that we could um, give out to our associates. So I thought about this and, uh, and I came up with this idea of a, uh, doing a box set with 12 of Neruda's poems and 12 of my prints. And, uh, and then my mind flicked back to our meeting, my meeting with Kip in, uh, in Cornwall. And so I rang Kip up and arranged to come up to Cambridge and told him what the project was all about and, uh, and what I intended to do. I also told him that I'd never printed a thing before in my life. And, um, but Kip very kindly said, well, don't worry about that. I will guide you through it and I'll help you. So Kip and I spent the next three months making these, um, these um, box sets. Um, Oh, bloody hell. Now, 
The printing process is, uh, is very different to painting. It's not better, it's not worse, it's just very different. And as you can see from this image here, the, what you do to make a silkscreen print, and Kip will probably tell you much better than I can later on, but you work on a photosensitive acetate. And each sheet of acetate is registered on top of the previous sheet. And each sheet is a colour separation, which seems fairly straightforward, except you're working in black and white. And you don't uh, know what the colour is going to be until you come to the proofing stage when you decide on the colours. The painting process is, um, is very different. Um, that's another example of the, how you separate the sheets. Um, the painting process is very different and um, it's much more instinctive than, um, than printing in that when I'm painting, I use colour in relation to form, shape, space, structure, etc. And I can see immediately if it's working or not. If it's not working, I can change it immediately. However, the more I printing I did with Kip, the more I realised there was some kind of link between um, painting and printmaking and some of Neruda's poems. Before starting the project, I reread a lot of Neruda's poems and plus an autobiography he'd written shortly before he died and didn't actually complete, the last chapter was completed by a friend of his. The title of the autobiography was called I Confess That I Lived. And he explains in the preface that this is not necessarily a factual account of his life, but it's, an account, it's how he thinks he remembers his life. And so it's how memory fuses with reality that creates the image of his own life. And in a sense, there's a kind of touch of magic realism in there. Um, and it also gave me a clue as to how to approach the, um, the making of this box set, because I didn't want to illustrate Neruda's poems. Uh, so I decided I would make the poems about my feelings about the poems, my responses to them. So we selected 12 poems, which were printed in English and Spanish, and 12 images which I, I made. Um, oh, bloody hell, I, I just don't understand what's going on. So that, that sorry, rather, is, is how the, the print ends. It starts like that, and ends like that. But you don't know it's going to end like that when you're doing the black and white. So, Neruda sometimes uses metaphor and fact side by side in his poetry. And I think this is uh, to both reveal and conceal elements to allow for the imagination and to get closer to the essence of the poem. In my own paintings, I also um, have, have always used uh, revelation and concealment by having some of the images behind layers of paint. So the images are, some of the images are less visible uh, as you move towards the surface, or more visible as you move towards the surface, less visible the further you go back into the painting, and occasionally fragmented. And I do this to, um, sorry, I, I, I do this to, so that when you're looking at my paintings, you read beyond the image. You can't understand the painting by just simply looking at what's on the top of it. You have to read right through it. See, this one's called Edge of Memory. And you can see behind the white of the painting, there's little fragments going on all over. And, the reason I painted this was because the edge of memory is like sometimes when you think of things in your life, you can't remember 
whether you've actually experienced it, whether someone's told you about it, or whether you've simply imagined it. And so that is um, what the painting is about. A second painting is this one, which is called Beneath Today. And um, as I said, I've, I've lived in Rome and I visit Rome very frequently. And I was always aware of how Romans built on top of previous generations. And in fact, the uh, Fora Romana, the uh, Roman Forum, which is the centre of the ancient, Rome, ancient Roman world, um, is about 16 metres below today's, today's Rome. And what you realise is in that depth of 16 metres are millions of lives millions of objects, millions of dreams, millions of structures. And so in this painting, I, you can see if you go back, this, back through the collage, back through the layering of paint, you will get to different fragments of imagery. And again, it's necessary to see those to understand the totality of the painting. So one thing that became very, <coughs> I became very aware of when I started making the uh, prints with Kip, was the link between printmaking, painting, or the way I paint, and poetry, the, one, the way Neruda wrote poetry. And that is this idea of concealment and revelation. So in printing, you don't know what the finished print's going to be like while you're in the process of drawing it out because you don't know what the colour's going to be like until you actually get to the proofing stage. So, so the, the print itself is concealed from you until it's revealed when the, when the image is at the screen and you decide the colours. In my painting, as I say, I use concealment and revelation to uh, allow people to read beyond the image. And... In the rudest poem, the poetry, he uses um, metaphor and statement to do exactly the same. So that, I found, was the link which sustained me through making this whole project. I'm going to give you... Um, oh, bloody hell. Uh, this is one of the prints uh, from the box set, and it's called The Bell. And this poem was written... It was one of the last poems that Neruda wrote, and it, um, Neruda at the time was serving as a Chilean ambassador to France. Whilst there, he uh, was diagnosed with cancer. So he resigned his post immediately, flew back to uh, Chile, and went to his house in Isla Negra. Isla Negra is on the coast overlooking the South Pacific. Throughout his life, Neruda and was an obsessive collector of objects. And amongst the things he collected were ship's bells. When he arrived back in Isla Negra, he noticed that one, his favorite bell, had fallen from the stanchion, which was outside of the house overlooking the ocean, hit the ground and broken. And I think in this poem, he relates the state of the broken bell to his own terminal illness. So <clears throat> I'll read the poem for you now. This broken bell still wants to sing. The metal now is green. The colour of wood, this bell. The colour of water in stone pools in the forest. Colour of day in the leaves. The bronze cracked and green. The bell with its mouth open to the ground and sleeping was entangled in bindweed and the hard golden colour of the bronze turned the colour of a frog. It was the hands of water. The dampness of the mast dealt green to the metal and tenderness to the bell. This broken bell, miserable in the root thicket of my wild garden, green bell, wounded, its scars immersed in the grass. It calls to no one anymore. No one gathers around its goblet except one butterfly that flutters over the fallen metal and flies off 
escaping on yellow wings. So you can see now that, it, now in this image, in that bottom right section there, there's a, there's a fragmented bell, and also, but it's fused with a portrait of Neruda. So you can't, there's actually no recognition of either the bell or Neruda in that. But it's, it relates very strongly to the poem. Now, reading Neruda's uh, biography, I also realised we had something very important in common. And that was that both our mothers, both our mothers, died when we were a few days old. And that neither of us knew what our mother looked like until we were fully grown adults when we were given photographs. In my case, and I think also in the rudest case, um, I learnt about my mother through fragments. So people would come up to me and say things like, your hair's like your mother's. You've got a smile like your mother. Your eyes are the same colour as your mother. But I didn't know what my mother looked like. So, again, in that sense, things were concealed and then revealed when I actually saw the photograph as an, uh, as an uh, adult. And um, um, what um, I then did was it kind of emphasised this thing of concealment and revelation to me. What I'm, this is uh, one of the prints from the box set about uh, a poem which Neruda wrote about this very uh, same subject. And in it, I've actually, I've actually abbreviated this because it's a very long poem and I've uh, taken several verses out of it because uh, there wouldn't be time to read it all. The verse I took out describe an earthquake in his childhood, which again is very ironic because when I was in Chile, there was a massive earthquake, which was quite scary. This um, poem is called Nascimento, or Birth. <clears throat> a man was born, one of many who were born. I lived amongst many men who lived, and this is something which has no history, just earth. I no longer remember the landscape or the time, the face or the figures, just the impalpable dust, the tale of summer and the cemetery where they took me to see amongst the two my mother sleep. And as I had never seen her face, I called to her amongst the dead to look on her. But like the others who are buried there, she neither hears or knows and answers nothing. And there she stayed alone, without her son, withdrawn, evasive, amongst the shades. And then came I from that peral of the trembling earth, earth laden with grapes, which were born of my dead mother. Um, I had um, something very interesting. When I went to Latin America, I was very moved by the response of the people coming to the museums uh, to see the show because it was so unlike anything I'd experienced in Europe. So I'd go into the exhibition in the morning and people had pinned flowers next to the paintings or written little poems and there'd be a queue of people wanting to talk to you. Now, these people weren't, you know, a cultural elite. They were everyone. They're, they're from the very poorest, the middle classes, the politicians, the upper classes. And it struck me how much culture was a central part of their life, how it re reflected their thoughts and their feelings. And, you know, I go to Tate Modern quite a lot, as I'm sure Nigel does, and the thing... <laughs> The thing you feel there is that, you know, there's people, groups rushing around the exhibitions. And in fact, there's often more people in the shop or the restaurant than what there are in the exhibition. And it's becoming more like a, <clears throat> a kind of shopping mall than a cultural institution. It's so opposite 
to what I experienced in Latin America. The other thing that happened in Latin America was a, a very old lady in some Buenos Aires, a very old lady came up to me and she says, I think from seeing your paintings and your understanding of Neruda that you would like to come with, with us on Wednesday. And I didn't know who the hell she was, you know. And but, um, she turned out to be the mother, the leader of the mother of the disappeared. And so I went to, to the, with them to the Casa Rosada, the presidential palace in Buenos Aires. And it was one of the most moving experiences I've ever had because they didn't demonstrate, they didn't shout, they didn't speak, they just stood there in a group with photographs of the missing children hung around their neck. And it was so, so moving. Um, throughout my time in <coughs> Latin America, and I, I, went, I was back and forth several times because I was also designing a set for the Royal Festival at the same time. So I was having to whip between the two continents. But um, throughout the time in Latin America, I met lots of Neruda's friends and lots of his associates. One of them was um, his best friend, who was called Velodia Tietelbaum. <clears throat> and it was my birthday while I was out there, and Velodia said, look, um, I'd like to take you to a restaurant for dinner on your birthday. So he took me to a restaurant where he and Neruda used to have dinner every Saturday. And whilst there, he told me a fabulous story. Um, in 1946, Neruda was charged with treason because he wrote a letter to every newspaper in Latin America condemning the Chilean government for their brutality and savagery towards the miners in the Atacama Desert. And for that, he was charged with treason. So Valerdia said to me, I was round at Neruda's and we were having a chat and some coffee. He said, and the military arrived. And uh, he said, the leading officer came up and he said, Senor Neruda, I come here today to arrest you on a charge of treason. He said, and Neruda said, yes, I believe so, yeah. And he said, but before I do that, Senor, could you possibly do me a great favour? And Neruda said, well, what, what do you want? He says, could you possibly recite for me your poem, uh, Tonight I Can Write? because it's the poem that brought me and my wife together, and it means so much to us. So Neruda said, oh, OK, then I'll... And so Neruda read the poem to the officer who came to arrest him. And Valerie says, and the officer stood to attention and saluted Neruda throughout the recital. And at the end of the recital, um, he said, um, well, senor, that was beautiful, but could you kindly put your hands behind your back now while I anchor for you? And um, they, they handcuffed Neruda, and Velodia said to me, they took him down to the car, waiting to, uh, which was waiting to take him to the prison. And then, smiling, Velodia said to me, but you see, Senor Pete, the car, it never reached the prison. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just a wonderful story. Um, I, I'll read the poem which saved Neruda's life. <laughs> Um, they call it Tonight I Can Write. And it's a beautiful poem. I think it's, <clears throat> it's the most popular poem in the Spanish language as far as I know. It's a, it was written when he was a very young man and he had a, a very intense relationship with this girl. But the girl was from the other side of the track. She came from a very wealthy family. And the, the fa her, her family, uh, they insisted that the relationship was broken up. And so Neruda wrote this poem to her. It's called Tonight I Can Write. And this is the... Oh, bloody hell. And this is the print from the box set. Which, Tonight I can write the saddest lines. Write, for example, the night is shattered. And the blue stars shiver in the distance. The night wind revolves in the sky and sings. Tonight I can write the saddest lines. I loved her, 
and sometimes she loved me too. Through nights like this, I held her in my arms. I kissed her again and again under the endless sky. She loved me. Sometimes I loved her too. How could one not have loved her great still eyes? Tonight I can write the saddest lines to think that I do not have her, to feel that I have lost her, to hear the immense night still more immense without her, and the verse fall to the soul like dew to the pasture. What does it matter that my love could not keep her? The night is shattered and she is not with me. This is all. In the distance, someone is singing. In the distance. My soul is not satisfied that it has lost her. My sight searches for her as though to go with her. My heart looks for her. And she is not with me. The same night whitening the same trees. We of that time are no longer the same. I no longer love her, that's certain. But how I loved her. My voice tried to find the wind to touch her hearing. Another's. She will be another's. Like my kisses before. A voice. A bright body. Her infinite eyes. I no longer love her, that's certain. But maybe I loved her. Love is so short. Forgetting so long because on nights like this when I held her in my arms my soul is not satisfied that it has lost her though this be the last pain that she makes me suffer and these the last verses that I write for her um, and that's the poem that saved me Ruda's life um, now one of the other people very interesting people I met out there. Um, if I can find a bloody flicker. Um, was, this is my girlfriend. It's, this is um, Hortensia Allende. She's the widow of President Salvador Allende, who was assassinated by Pinochet. And she came to the opening in Santiago, which is in the Neruda Foundation. And... Um, she came up to me and she said, oh, it's wonderful to be here tonight to see your pictures and to, to see the poems of Neruda. She says, it brings back so many happy memories tonight for me, for, of my husband and of our great friend Neruda. And because it was also the 25th anniversary of the death of, of uh, Salvador Allende, uh, there's lots of film crews around and, and press wanting an interview with her on the 25th anniversary of her death. Well, there's a film crew with me. And she just turned around and said, are they with you, dear? I said, yes, they are. Yes, they are. She said, well, why don't we do the interview? So I've got the only interview between, of, of Otenji Allende on the 25th anniversary of her father's death, or of her husband's death. And, um, and we became good friends, and I used to take her out for a drink, and, and we used to go and have dinner together and things like that. Also at, the, also at the opening was a British ambassador. And she says to me, uh, would you mind if I threw a party for you at the residency next week? I said, well, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, it'd be lovely. And um, the British residency is right opposite the Spanish residency, the Spanish ambassador's residency. So when I was going there, I got, I got to the gates and I noticed this piles of piles of rubbish outside both the gates of the British embassy and the gates of the Spanish uh, not embassy, the residency and um, anyway I went in and I said to the ambassador why is all that rubbish there she said because um, the firm <coughs> the firm that collects the rubbish in this area are Pinochet supporters so they won't take it for us because Pinochet had been arrested in England on the behest of the Spanish government uh, to be tried um, uh, for uh, crimes against humanity. And so these, these people would not remove the rubbish. Anyway, during uh, the party, the, um, the ambassador was introducing me to various people. 
And she introduced him to this guy who said he was a cultural attaché. And he kept saying to me, how do you know Tanjay Hindi? How do you know Victor Hara's wife? How do you know um, Valudi Tietelbaum, etc., etc.? Well, they're all like, you know, left wing. That's well, it's, it's through the paintings. It's just simply through the exhibition. Anyway, I arrived back in London um, about um, two weeks later. Pinochet's under house arrest in London. And uh, I got a phone call. And they said, look, we know you know Hortensia Allende, and we know that um, she trusts you. I said, well, who's we? They said, well, it's the Home Office. And I thought, bloody hell. And uh, so I, I said, they said, what we'd like you to do is to get a letter from Hortensia Allende addressed to you and asking you to give it to the Right Honourable Robin Cook, who was the Home Secretary. Uh, will you do it? Uh, on, uh, 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 saying what would happen to the democratic process in Chile in the event of um, Pinochet being put on trial. So, oh, bloody hell, you know. And uh, So anyway, I rang Hortensia and I explained to her what. And she said, yes, I'll do it, dear. And she, she faxed me this thing through and I took it round to the home office and had a cup of tea with Robin Cook and went through it and I explained what I thought about the, the, the situation in Chile. And, uh, uh, and eventually they came to an agreement with the Chilean government where, because what, what Hortensia said in that letter was, look, we're not looking for revenge. We simply want justice. And so the British government came to an agreement with the Chilean government to send Pinochet back to Chile into internal exile and under house arrest in the very south of Chile, away from anywhere. So... It was very revealing to me that I'd gone out there as an artist and come back as a bloody spy. I mean, <laughs> it's ridiculous. But anyway, a few days later, um, I got a phone call from the British ambassador. And she said to me, oh, she, do you remember the rubbish which was uh, outside both ours and the Spanish residency? I said, yeah, yeah. She said, well, I was driving through the gates today and it had all disappeared. She said, and uh, there was a wonderful note on the gate and it said, Madam Ambassador... As you are getting rid of our rubbish, we're getting rid of yours. And, it was, and a firm who were a Yendi supporter had come and removed all the bloody rubbish in the middle of the night. So it was, it was really quite an experience. Now, um, this, um, like, like, like Nigel with the, with the dance, uh, with the ballet, there's, a, there's also a fourth dimension to mine because a few years ago... Um, a contemporary jazz quartet uh, came to my studio and had seen an exhibition of mine in London and said, look, would you mind if we wrote some music about your work? And they spent a year coming in and out and they wrote a whole load of music. And partly it was solo instrumental, partly it was with this wonderful singer they got from Washington. And then they said, could you read some poems to some of the music? And so we, we kind of refined the music, so there's a fusion between the rhythm of the poem and the rhythm of the music. And we did it, when we, and, and then the, the, the images were projected onto a screen behind the stage. So we did that, and we did it both in London, in Copenhagen, in Russia, and it was, it was fantastic. And again, it was like this, this fusion of all different levels of creativity. So anyway, I'd like to finish. Oh, bloody hell. Um, I won't be second. <laughs> I'd like to finish by um, reading to you a very short uh, statement that Neruda made on receiving the Nobel Prize. And I think it's a wonderful statement because it, it sums up culture, it sums up humanity. And I think, you know, given the occasion when we're all here to celebrate Kip, Kip's uh, work as a printmaker and his help to so many artists of these, we should dedicate this to Kip. So what Neruda says is, poetry involves achieving a proper balance 
between solitude and solidarity, between feeling and action, between the intimacy of oneself, the intimacy of mankind, and the revelation of nature. Thank you. We're running a little bit behind time, Peter. Sorry? Um, we're running a little bit behind Sorry. time, but I could not interject um, and not listen here till the end of those fantastic stories. So thank you very, very much. Is there one quick question? Just Hi. the one? Okay. Can you tell me the name of the jazz band and if you're still doing the project? <laughs> I've done it. The, the first jazz, jazz band, um, it, it was run by a, a woman called Serena Riley, who was a singer from Washington, and a pianist called Tom Donald, who was Australian. I also did it in Copenhagen with a, a very famous um, pianist who, who was Miles Davis's piano player. And, uh, and I did it in Russia with Tom and Serena again. But what I've done, I, this is the box set which I've been talking about, the Neruda box set. And it's here today because um, um, this is going into Tom's, uh, to uh, Tom, into Jean Calpe's collection. But if any of you want to see it while it's here, just let me know. Okay, thanks very much.